WriteSpot is AgLeader's latest and trusted application technology, and it will be available for purchase later this summer. Spraying your crops is one of the most demanding jobs on your farm, right, Corey? Yes. And it's time sensitive, even when it's wet. When pests come in, got to be on on the Johnny on spot. That's it. Right spot. Nozzle by nozzle control allows you to maximize the effectiveness of your inputs with the right droplet size and coverage to give your crop exactly what it needs while minimizing waste on your farm. Saves you time and product, Corey. Visit agleader.com slash right spot to learn more. Ladies and gentlemen, farmers, ranchers, and distinguished guests. Thank you for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas, methods, trends, and techniques available to help your farm achieve higher levels of farm profitability. The Farm for Profit podcast is co-hosted by Tanner Winterhoff, the Iowa Bankerman, and David Whitaker, the Iowa Land Guy, where in tandem, they will share their ideas and advice from industry experts. Thank you again for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long. And now, here's Tanner and David. And listeners, welcome back to the Farm for Profit podcast. This is Tanner Winterhoff. This is Corey Hillebo. And this is David Whitaker. We are here for part two of the transition planning series that we put together. You uh, listened in more than likely to Elaine's episode before this. If you didn't, stop right now and go back and check out part one. But listeners, we appreciate you joining us. Remember, if you've got ideas like the ones we're covering today, email those to farmforprofitllc at gmail.com or find us all over social media. And we also thank you for telling your friends and family about us because that's the only way that we grow. And Tanner, let's talk about our listener review today, uh, BW Fusion, Alex Woodall. Uh, Love listening to the podcast, In the Tractor Tonight. I'm glad you're already in the tractor. That's fantastic. <laughs> and that came from Twitter. Tell me more about BW. You bet. If you sign up more than 500 acres of the 401 microbial team combined with Meltdown, and you mentioned Farm for Profit, you're going to get one free field in the BW 365 program. And according to Corey, that is more than worth it. It is. It's very much worth it. It's a good program. And Corey, you can leave us a voicemail if you want to know more about it. What's the number? 515-207-9640. All right. So we are about ready to jump into the second of two parts. So it went really well with the Hayes family. You have uh, obviously listened to that. What a cool way and and what almost a, just a generous thing for them to do for all of our listeners to expose their their non-start yeah. to succession planning. It's such a tough topic for yeah. for all families, for any business, really. But then you throw in farming, it's so emotional, and then you have to be ran it like a business, and Elaine was just a wealth of knowledge. I mean, she's like a librarian when it comes to the books that she was you know, <laughs> talking about. So yeah. I'm really looking forward to uh, what happens after these podcasts and where everything goes. And like we promise in this show, uh, I do have that entire list. We will have that posted in the show notes so you can reference the materials that she talked about. But we are joined again in this episode, this part two, by Elaine Fraze. And we're going to tackle more of the questions. We inserted a couple, inserted, inserted, Mm -hmm. that's right, a couple of your questions last time in between the conversation with the Hayes family. But this episode here is solely focused on the curious spots and questions that you guys have. So, Corey, you think we're ready? Should we jump into it? Let's get into it. Back with us is Elaine Fraze. Again, certified professional speaker and coach. She's got her goal of helping farm families work through their discussions of the undiscussable. I keep saying that again, Elaine, because I just think that is fantastic to where people feel like they can't talk about something, Corey. And that's that's the exact opposite of the way this can go. So she's here to share her passion, as we heard in the first show, to provide practical and actionable tools to farm families so they can talk through tough issues and get traction on their farm transition. So, Corey, what do you say we welcome Elaine back? Let's get let's get right to it. Welcome, Elaine. Thanks, Dave. Corey. Corey. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Dave was here for the first show. I'm filling in. Dave had to step out for a second, so you get the backup. <laughs> but that's okay. That's good. I'm actually it's the, going through. It's the closer. We got the closer. There you go. Bring in the closer. I'm actually going through the same thing that the Hayes was going, uh, and probably in, a, in my dad's 64, and I'm 34, and my brother's, I think, 27. So uh, we're in some of the same situations of, uh, you know, where do we go from here? And we had a close call last week. My dad broke his leg, and uh, he's out for the spring. And so 
I'm fine with that, but my, we just brought my brother back to the farm fresh last year, so it'll be a uh, jump right in moment. So I'm enjoying where we're going with this. So we have a lot of listener questions, and that's what we're going to do with this part. Amazing it, questions, too. I've, I've gone through all of them and scribbled little responses just to get prepared. And So I may have changed up the order as, they, as they've as they come in uh, to try and kind of help with the flow and get some things categorized. Um, we did promise to all of our listeners that they would remain somewhat anonymous, but we will put a geographical tag with them so maybe our listeners can get some perspective of whether it's coming from cotton country, coming from the Midwest, um, or where we're looking at. So the first one we have is... I find it difficult being the youngest generation to get my family to begin talking about succession planning things because I feel like I'm asking for a handout or trying to be nosy and see what's going on. What can a grandson do to get the ball rolling with grandpa and dad in talking about some type of transition plan? So very interesting question. I asked this again in a different um, situation just recently. And again, Brene Brown uses the concept, what is the story you're telling yourself? And when someone comes out of curiosity, Tanner, I don't think that, I don't think that they'll be perceived as being needy or greedy or entitled. Um, and he, he uses the term asking for a handout. And so there's this thing in conflict resolution called intent, action, effect. And I always ask farm families, what is your intent? And they say, oh, Elaine, my intent is for everyone to get along and want to come back for family gatherings. And I, I want this to be clear. I want people to understand why we've made certain decisions. So for this young man to get the ball rolling, I, I think, first of all, is to plant the seed and not being self-promotional. But one way that you can plant the seed is by ordering my books or going on my website or just getting people to go to my website and read hundreds and hundreds of blogs or go on YouTube and listen to my videos. And if people listening to this podcast want to just come to my website and ask me for my document of links, I can give you a whole list of podcasts and links that I've been on and, and videos that will help people get comfortable about the coaching process. Because what this son is really asking is, I'm afraid that I'm going to come across an entitled, but what's the bigger picture? The bigger picture here is you're going to help grandpa and your parents all find more certainty about their future. And I have an article that I wrote, Tanner, called Strong Warning for 80-Year-Olds. And when a young son-in-law looked his father-in-law in the eyes and he said, Charlie, do you have no idea that your lack of coming to the table is crushing your daughter's and my dreams? I just need you to know that. And that was the conversation, Tanner, that was the tipping point to things actually starting to get done. Wow. So I think if you come with clear intent, no intent to cause harm, but from curiosity, I think that hopefully will be honored. So this question was from uh, South Central Kansas and it had several bullet points underneath them. Did you want to uh, go through them as, as well? Because I... What, the first one I actually picked out from uh, the previous conversation with the Hayes, and uh, he stated, how do young people avoid massive amounts of debt in succession plan? And you asked Sid and the boys, you know, how much risk and debt are you willing to take on? Because with farms, there is a lot. So is there a way to avoid it? To avoid debt altogether? Or, right? or to lessen it? And then yes. Soften the blow? Yes. yes. Okay. One of, one, of the, one of the ways is, first of all, pay attention to your personal spending. Because what we have in agriculture is we have employed children, adult children, who are not being paid a fair wage. And they're making $18,000 Canadian a year or $30,000 U.S. a year. And I go, are you kidding me? And they go, Elaine, what's wrong? I said, you have no money or income for disposable uh, servicing of debt. You don't even have enough money to live on. Right. And so people, first of all, Corey, are not paying attention to what they need personally, because if you take care of your needs personally, you're going to be emotionally strong and healthy to be rational, to make good business decisions, to actually manage debt. But if you can't even pay your own personal bills, then we can't talk about adding debt to the list. Mm -hmm. Right? 
The other thing I'd like to say is there's a book called Emotional Blackmail by Susan Ford. And one of the tool language pieces she uses is, where is it written? Where is it written that you have to buy everything from your parents? Because our son certainly won't be buying land from us. He can't. He can't afford it. He already has a six-figure debt with our neighbor who got divorced than land he bought from the neighbor. Mm -hmm. So that's why these financial conversations are no longer hush-hush and secret. They have to be totally transparent. So this same listener, like I said, had a a lot of good follow-up questions um, that we may come back to as far as that goes. But another listener out of eastern South Dakota said, as a consultant, sometimes I get in the middle of these family discussions. I've never had one get too contentious or out of hand, but does she have any advice for helping third parties like myself assisting families? For example, I've got a couple of farmers who are nearing retirement age with no heir apparent to the operation and no plan in place. Is there a way for a third party to start these discussions? Yes, absolutely. And obviously this advisor or consultant has a trusted relationship with these families that he or she is serving. Um, And they they can get contentious. And so I would, first of all, sign up for my biweekly insights that comes out every two weeks and get familiar with the resources I have so that he can give those resources to the farm family to learn new language or new, new ways of doing. And for the families who have no heir apparent to the operation and no plan in place, my um, encouragement would get them to find a financial planner so that they could see where their income streams are going to be from and whether or not they might like to have long-term lease agreements to lease out their farmland and rent it to someone who stewards the land well. The third opportunity is to adopt a non-family, non-related member to manage your um, farm. And that comes with a trust relationship, mentorship, and joint venture agreements. And in the U.S., um, there's a fellow, there's two people, Lance Woodbury and uh, Dick Whitman, who both have amazing resources. And Dick is actually having a training session, I think in Kansas City on on June 15th. And so for any consultant listening to this podcast, Go to Whitman, W-I-T-T-M-A-N, consulting.com and find out all you can about Dick's training that's happening. And Lance uh, Woodbury will also be there. I've taken it myself and I rely very heavily on um, Dick Whitman's toolbox because he's so good at farm management. And he's now 70 and he's stepping back without stepping away. And his daughter is managing their 20,000 acre farm. Wow. The next one here comes from central Iowa uh, and it says what I've always found most useful and fascinating are examples of good plans and not so good plans common themes that you see Elaine that uh, you see that's good or bad right and so I don't like labels of good or bad um, but I do like it when people understand that the plan that they have developed has been with the input of all the parties that will be affected And that's why I coach the Hayes family to have the spouses present when they have these meetings. Because I had one family who said, oh, Elaine, we've just been given a bill for $30,000. They expect us to farm with our brother who we can't get along with. And we never even had a family meeting. And I actually called the consulting firm on that. And I said, what were you thinking? Right. You can't just prescribe things like you're taking off, you know, a checklist. And, And very often farmers will call me and say, I want your checklist for doing farm transition. And I'll say there isn't one. There's maps in terms of what we need to talk about, but every family is unique. And I also don't know the character or what story people are telling themselves and about whether or not they're being honest. I have one family right now that I worked with 10 years ago. They completed the 10 year plan and now they're back. And they say, Elaine, dad won't get a will. I said, seriously, he's worth millions and he's using something off the internet? And they go, yes. But the mom did and she went and got a will and I I was hoping that it would tick him off enough to put him into action and seeking out a lawyer, but he actually didn't do that. So I I think with this question, you know, examples of good plans and not so good ones, 
is if something in your gut intuitively doesn't feel right, you should get a second opinion. And accountants and lawyers love to be prescriptive, but that's down the funnel. So think of a, a, a steel or tin funnel that you'd use for changing oil. And in Canada, we buy one of these at Princess Auto. The work I do as a farm family coach is the, the, big, the big intake part, is, is figuring out what does everybody think, feel, need, and want about the future of the family and the future of the farm business. And after that's all distilled out, after about six to eight hours of coaching, we come to a family meeting. And in that meeting, we talk about whatever we've talked about privately, but now they speak it to the rest of the family because they've been coached, they've been prepared. And then you come down to the nozzle piece. And that nozzle, Corey, is where the accounting logistics and the tax efficiency and all the other good stuff is. But farmers just want to jump way down the funnel, way to tax. like, And that's a tactical thing. And I have this friend, Chris Delaney, who wrote a book in Canada called The Naked Opus, which is an interesting title. But he right. uses the same approach I do in terms of a holistic approach. And he says this, do not hide behind your advisors. How many farmers, Corey, do you know that are buying equipment they don't really need or can afford on December 24th because they're trying to beat year-end tax. Yeah. Face it, you pay taxes because you've been profitable. Be thankful you pay taxes, but pay taxes efficiently, efficiently by using sound professional advice of your accounting firm. But don't go to taxes first. You have a lot more work to do at the top of the funnel. So this listener also had some follow-up questions that tie in with another listener. So that was from Central Iowa, is also going to dive into another one from Northwest Iowa, and that is, what about the idea of making things fair and not then fair might not always be equal? And then the way it was phrased from our Northwest Iowa friend is fair and equitable. Two heirs, one makes a living on the farm, the other has a career off the farm, what types of ideas do you have to assure that the farm stays in the family and assures the opportunity for it to move on to the next generation? Many, many responses to this. First of all, stop using the word equal. It's another piece of your vocabulary that now is out the door. Fair is helping everyone in the family be successful. I'll say it again. Fair is helping everyone in the farm family be successful. What do you need, non-farming brother, to be successful? Elaine, I'm good, I have a great income, we've used financial planning. I just want my mom and dad to enjoy the fruit of their 40 years of labor. I don't expect anything from this farm and anything I get from my parents' estate will be a bonus. No, you have the other child who's part of a family that thinks just because I'm one of the four siblings of this family, what's my fair DNA? I want this farm chopped up into four equal pieces. Newsflash, it's no longer 1942. Mm -hmm. It is now 2022. A farm is not a piece of pie. A farm is a business. A farm in Iowa has beautiful cornfields and very expensive ground and lots of childhood memories. But where is it written that it's the parents' responsibility to make all of their children economically equal, especially when one's a dentist in Minnesota and the other one's an engineer in Omaha? That's crazy making. And that is why my YouTube video, Finding Fairness in Farm Transition, now has over 2,500 hits, which is not what Beyonce gets, but that's a good number for a farm family coach, right? Uh -huh. and, so, and so guys, here, here's the question. What is the expectation of the parents for themselves? And the other thing I see happening, which makes me sad, is parents will continue to sacrifice their own well-being based on unrealistic expectations of their children. And that's where this has to stop is you need to make sure that you and your husband or you and your wife, your spouse, are well taken care of. Then you need to have the conversation about 
what would you like from my estate or from this farm? Or what would you like the relationship to be to this farm? Because if there's one farm heir, my husband always says he's very grateful that he was the only heir to the farm. But his sisters all got land in 1992 when they were 30 something. His parents were living. And when I tell this story, Tanner, people say, I can't believe it. I said, well, in 1992, those quarters were worth $67,000. And because my mother-in-law was raised by a wicked stepmother, truly, she said, I will transfer our farm, but I want all of the girls to get land, which to us was fine because part of the expectation and the agreement was if you're no longer going to have this land, you're going to sell it to your brother and sister-in-law, or you're going to uh, rent it to them at a fair market value. So it was very clear that the land would still be accessible to us. Okay. Yeah. Now that was 1992. Tanner, those same quarters that those girls were given when they actually needed money, would you need money in your mid thirties? Absolutely. They got money to help them decorate or renovate houses or pay off a divorce or do whatever. But now we fast forward another um, 30 years down the road and it's 2022. Those same quarters are worth $440,000. And the girls could say, oh, must be nice to be you. I wish I would. Look, you got the time opportunity of money. You got money 30 years ago when you absolutely needed it. Do any of my husband's sisters need money now? No, they do not. So here's the problem. We have to change the mindset in agriculture around fairness, and we have to treat the farm as a business. And a farm needs critical mass, and you cannot keep cutting off the critical mass and expect the farm to still be viable. And that's not the answer this person from Iowa wanted to hear. <laughs> he hasn't met me yet. <laughs> oh man, I got into that one. Well, well, I'll just I'll just transition here real quick, Corey, before you ask the next one. So, out of Central Kansas, it's it's funny you bring that up because this is what the listener wrote down: is generationally splitting the ground evenly between kids has caused those quarters to become eighties to now become forties. But how do you go smaller? You you can't. So, yeah, you kind of answered and led right into that. So the follow-up questions the Central Kansas listener had is, just ballpark, what does a succession plan cost? Just a quick, what's it cost? Right. So I'm going to break that into two pieces. Let's talk about farm family coaching first. I believe strongly, of course, that people need to communicate first. And as a family – get really clear on what they want and desire and envision first before they go start talking to their advisors. And I'll use a family that I worked with case in point. I spent um, four or five hours with them uh, privately, individually, and then a two to three hour family meeting. So let's say I spent eight hours with this family before they went to start talking to their accountant and lawyer, because when they did, the lawyer said to them, oh my goodness, you actually really know what you want. And she said, yeah, that's because we've already spent eight hours with Elaine. And so the point is, is for people to know what they want before they start going to the advisors so that they can have more of a dialogue with those advisors. So coaching with me for 10 hours would cost you $3,500. And um, that would get most families through individual coaching and then to a two-hour family meeting, which we would do on Zoom. And then there would be more follow-up coaching as needed to make sure things were kept accountable and kept happening. For accounting and legal, I have a friend who's a Royal Roads trained coach in Saskatchewan. His name is Ray Riel. And his ballpark uh, figure, I asked him this exact same question, was less than $20,000, which to me was very reasonable. I have seen succession plans, Tanner, that cost thirty grand. And the woman said to me, Elaine, I would have rather written you the check than this firm because we got no value from it whatsoever. So when you're engaging with an advisor, you should get very clear from them. What are the outcomes expected to be of working with you? How long do you expect this to take? And what is the range of how much this might cost? And in Canada, we also have GST, which is goods and services tax. 
And so that will be added on to the bill as well. It also depends how complicated it is and how sure. many corporations. We have two corporations on our farm. So well, that sure leads is. into one from uh, Northeast Iowa. And it's his, actually his second one that he asked. But since it goes with us, is there a crazy situation or the what's the biggest mess that you have helped fix? I guess if you can be anonymous about it or something unique that's just entertaining, I guess. Uh, this is not at all entertaining. And um, I, I circled this one when he used the phrase craziest situation. My friend Derry Latimer has a, a new book out called Not Crazy, Just Human. And it talks about her depression journey. The, the hardest situation I've ever seen is a young successor who developed uh, bipolar disorder in, in his 40s. And this is a mental health issue which we tried to mitigate, which was not successful. And the other part of this question that I don't agree with, that she was able to fix. Elaine Fraze can only fix Elaine Fraze. And that's Tanner when I hold up my 916th wrench. Farmers love 916th wrenches, right? Because that's the one they use to help set the combines or the old combines. And they have this mentality. Farmers have what we call avoidance or away from behavior because they're always used to fixing stuff. And they'll call me and they'll say, Elaine, you have to fix my daughter-in-law or you have to fix my son, you have to fix this. And my first words out of my mouth is, stop right now. I don't fix anything. You do the work, I facilitate the hard conversations and I draw out of you what you need to tell the rest of your family. The best success I have is when I meet a family three or four years down the road, or even a couple of months, and they say, thank you for giving me my husband back. Thank you for showing us that walking away from a toxic situation was actually a good ending, a necessary ending, not a failure. And I now have a team of eight coaches, and a few of those coaches are former clients of mine who are no longer in farming family transition. They have got other careers, and they are becoming replicates of my work. You know, in a way, you are the 916th wrench because a 916th wrench does nothing by itself, but you are a tool in the toolbox to help them right. get yeah. the job done. But they're probably going to need a lot of other wrenches and tools in that box to get it done. So, Right, and it's not one size fits all. Thanks, Corey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was... Good job, Corey. So not a 916, okay, okay. more of a crescent, a crescent wrench. Well, uh, the other thing I had about that was I thought you were in Canada, and I didn't know you knew what 916 inch wrenches were. Oh, I thought you guys we, were on the metric system. That's a 13 millimeter. <laughs> we're, we're so adaptable up here in the yeah, great true okay. north. We use both. That's great. So this, this was from a listener out of north central Kansas, and uh, it says, Interesting, our family's been going through this very thing for the past few years, too. So it as we've talked about this is plans aren't decided in a 10 hour meeting. These, these are evolving and they're continuing to adapt. Uh, the first question I'm not going to have you answer because we kind of already had, but it gives you perspective for the second one is what suggestions do you have for the next generation of the business to ensure that they don't kill the goose that lays the golden eggs for their best interest, but to ensure the business is around for more generation to enjoy the golden eggs. And we've talked about that, but the follow-up question is should the next generation or the successors have benchmarks or expectations beyond a normal average employee put in place before they get transferred ownership or major responsibilities? Absolutely. You hire for skill, not based on blood. Where is it written that just because you're the oldest son, you get the farm and uh, Dick Whitman speaks very strongly about this, and, and he has a 28-page tool um, called the Family Business Questionnaire in terms of the history of the farm. And, and just to what you alluded to in terms of the golden goose, Tanner, there's um, an expression in financial planning called shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. And that's the fear, is that grandpa cleared the land, dad built it up, and son or daughter loses it all, right? And so those are the things that you need to talk about. But but 
Stephen Stefan, S T E P H A N Poulter wrote a book called The Father Factor, which is another excellent book that I'd highly re recommend for the women listening to this who want to understand what's gone sideways with the father son relationship. And of this father factor book, only 20% of fathers are what we call a compassionate mentor. The rest are time bombs or passive aggressive or of other styles which are not healthy. So in farming, can you imagine how unstoppable it is for a father who doesn't see his son or daughter in agriculture as a threat? And together they use the skills that they have complementary to each other to build an amazing business. And in our family, we've done personal style indicators on, on everybody in our family to know what our strengths are, even my daughter-in-law. My daughter-in-law should be the office administrator. I should not be. I should be the one doing the work of the podcasting like we're doing today. And my husband should be the one making sure the bins are all closed and the market contracts have been signed. But my son should be the one who's selling the grain and doing all the marketing because everybody loves him. He's super off the charts for um, people where my, where my husband is off the charts for tasks. All of this to say is the benchmarks should be personal style indicators, performance feedbacks, roles and responsibilities, and an understanding of conflict triggers so that you treat the people in your business as if you had an HR department. I, I like the last comment you made about having an HR department because I can see that in my own family, especially with the, the way hiring takes place and the way some tasks are delegated. Um, exactly. You would not put in the banking world, you would not put somebody with extremely great personal skills and sales ability and stick them in your back office doing the accounting work unless they were even far superior in their accounting skills. So the same thing would go is if you have somebody who is great at record keeping and very detail oriented, not necessarily going to be the everyday laborer uh, and those skills can be used. Um, but then right. and just for your listeners sake, Tanner, uh, I have what's called the PSI, the personal style assessment from CRG leader group. And um, I also have the other assessment we mentioned in the other podcast, the conflict, conflict dynamic profile. And I, each of these assessments are only like $35 US each or 50. It's not very much, but it's great insight to find out what the strengths of your current team are. And it's a good it's a good self-awareness piece for people to understand why they're so frustrated. Because if you've been forced into a role, like there is no way on this earth you would ever see me doing the accounting. And just because I'm female doesn't mean I need to do the books. Right. Never going to happen. Right. So one of the other questions this same listener out of North Central Kansas had is, if you have these conversations and you get, you get down a path, when do you realize that it might be easier or will choose the better decision to sell the farm business instead of passing it on to an heir? That's, that's a very um, difficult question, but the core value that you need to have is honesty. Are you truly being honest or are you doing this because it's the voice of your grandfather on your left shoulder saying, and I met um, he's a rancher from Rochester, Minnesota, and he says, Elaine, have you ever watched Yellowstone? And no, I've never watched Yellowstone. <laughs> he said, well, it's almost like there's been some kind of a death vow spoken on the bed in agriculture where the grandfather or the, the patriarch says, whatever happens, don't ever sell the land. And again, I use the word that was then and this is now. And there are people who take a really hard look at the passion and the calling and the 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 amount of risk that people want to take. I mean, I talk to these ranch families who are literally sacrificing their physical well-being to manage 600 cow calves. And now we have winter here again, and they're not doing spring calving, they're doing winter calving and their margins are low. And, and at some point you say, when can you no longer manage this? And it's hard to let go of what you expect other people expecting of you. But at some point you have to say, this isn't worth it anymore. And, and so I often challenge farm families at the end of the day, does it matter what your net worth is? 
what is it you truly want? And what I say is I want to be rich in relationship towards God and rich in relationships, period. Anything else is a bonus, but that's the core of what I expect because I know that when I pass, I'm not taking anything with me. And that's why I find this so interesting where men especially have this high need to tell me what their net worth is. I said, I don't care what your net worth is. Are you living a meaningful and fulfilled purpose, full life? And are you in right relationship with your family and the people around you? Because money cannot buy relationship. And, and, and again, I will not repeat, Tanner, as I said earlier, the, the sad stories. Because my hashtag for agriculture is hashtag healing stories, number four, egg. Because we need to copy success. And we need to know what works well. We don't need to keep regurgitating. Oh, did you hear what happened to the neighbors? He's not talking to his brother anymore. That story is very old and it doesn't help remove bitterness and it doesn't help people let go of something that's no longer working. The other issue we have, especially in Iowa, is all of the farm widows. And they, I think I can't remember the stat, but Iowa has a very high percentage of female operators. And, and you need to recognize those strong women in agriculture are not going to be pushed around. But there are a lot of farm women all across the U.S. and Canada who are being bullied by children who have unreasonable expectations. And they are not being well, well served because they need to see um, their own financial path. And maybe their financial path requires that they sell the farm because that's the only way they can get the equity they need to secure their financial well-being for the next 30 years. So what? just real quick, Dave, that statistic in Iowa is 36%, according okay. to the Google machine. Thank yep, you. That are, that are female-based. Tagging on to his question just a little bit, uh, he, they're asking about when do we sell the business instead of passing it on. When I think of selling the business, how many parents that you work with – Technically, they were willed the ground, or they they have the ground, or bought the ground, purchased the ground. It's it's their asset. Often, I hear people that won't sell as a realtor. They won't sell because, well, I got to give it to the kids. Well, who says you have to give it to the kids? Exactly. Um, Where is it written? And and there, I, I wonder how many kids uh, have that entitlement deal right now. How oh. how many how many kids uh, do you think have the entitlement, or can, what can you speak to entitlement, and and how do we? How do we, as the next generation, realize that, hey, it's not our asset yet. If we happen to get willed it, great. If not, mom and dad want to sell it and become millionaires, game on. And there you go, Mr. Dave. This too can be yours for $67 in my shop on my website. <laughs> I actually did the seminar last year and we called it entitlement, how to deal with greed and entitlement with, with siblings. Because in my blog posts, one of my most viewed blogs is help the non-farm siblings want the farmland. And that strikes fear into everybody's heart, right? Because they know they can't chop it up. We talked about that earlier. But the whole thing about greed and entitlement in agriculture is that it's not spoken. It's not talked about. So how do you tame the greed monster? Is you address it. And you can say, what part of no do you not understand? I have given you a college university or a college education at Iowa State. That in itself, your engineering degree is worth $20,000 US. Do you understand that? I gave you roots and wings from this farm. And I'm sorry if you think that you need ground to put into your net worth, but that is not going to happen because this ground is allocated for whoever is going to farm this as a business. And whether that's going to be one of your siblings, maybe not. And if nobody, then it's going to be me because guess what? I'm going to rent out this ground. And I know land in Iowa rents for like $300 an acre, right? It's, it's amazing. So how much income can you get from renting out your land and still owning it? And maybe when I pass, this, this may go to you. But I'm sorry. If you've if you read the book, there's a book by Randy Elkhorn called Time, Money, Eternity, and Possessions. And he says, it's a really bad idea to give your child $5 million. <laughs> so you might want to talk about other causes or foundations and, and other ways that you want to be philanthropic. But 
You might also want to give it to your kids, but maybe not until you're ready to make that transition. I'm a big believer, Dave, in passing on assets with a warm hand, not a cold one, because wills are an interesting document. They can also be changed three days before death. Mm -hmm. Yes. That makes people feel uh, afraid. And that's why I love to have joint titles on things. And then there's no question who that land is going to. Yeah, that, that actually leads really well into our last, the last listener question that we're going to attack today. Um, I see us having a future conversation around, uh, I think it was, uh, again, asked by about seven different listeners, um, about in-laws and incorporating those, but we're not going to talk about those today because I know we could spend uh, an entire show. So maybe we can catch up again down the road. But I'll just interject. We're doing a webinar on in-laws, Tanner, on June 11th. So listeners that want to know more about in-laws can go to iowafarmerswife.com forward slash events and sign up. And they'll be able to ask me private questions through texting me on my phone. So no one will know who is asking the question. Hmm. Oh, that's great. That will work out really well. But the last one here is out of the people that you work with and actually succeed in keeping the farm in the family. So you just talked about potentially put, passing assets with a warm hand, the percentage of the families that are okay with the plan after the parents pass, is it a communication that gets everybody on board beforehand or is it still not a perfect solution to happiness? I'm using happiness as my own word, not the listener's word afterwards when mom and dad are not around. So let's make a distinction here. I think in my notes that I made before, A succession slash transition plan is not an estate plan. Succession transition is the transfer of labor, management, and ownership. Our son is 33. We have transitioned a multi-million dollar business to him at age 33. He will be paying us a six-digit income for the next 20 years. That was a transition plan. Our estate plan is for when we die. When we die, our daughter who is not able to work will be given a certain level of income through a trust relationship for the rest of her life. And she has already met her trustee and she feels really good about that because he's young like she is and they will have an ongoing relationship. Our son, when we die, will inherit more land, which is partly in a corporation right now and also partly held personally. This is very important for people to understand. A succession transition plan is much better done when you're living because it's not an estate plan. Waiting for the surprise of the will to be read is a horrible, horrible (laughs) idea. People need certainty when they're 40 because Tanner, if you are 40, your dad is 62. Your dad doesn't plan on dying at 62 He maybe will be here till he's 97. And I remember a client whose father was 97. And she says, Elaine, when my father dies, I will inherit a million dollars. And that money right away will go into da da da. But the problem is, is that people are confusing and mishmashing a succession transition plan versus a um, estate plan. Please get as much done as you can while you can while you're living because then you can explain your why and your intent to everyone in your family and that will create more harmony because people under will understand why you made the decisions you made even if they don't agree that's okay right so i i'm going to encourage listeners to take your advice and do that and do it before it's forced upon you so i i come from a family to where my father took over the farm much earlier than I'm going to say should have, but it was due to a heart attack. Hmm. Grandpa was still alive, but unable to perform those tasks. So the succession plan happened out of necessity to where my father took over the farming operations. And then again, there was an estate plan following his death. You know, there was a large gap of time between those very thankfully a large gap of time. Um, so I can see exactly what you're saying, Elaine. But what what do you think we should ask next, Dave? I, I have two questions. And one is, most of the time when we think secession planning, we think uh, there's already an operation there. In in my case, actually, 
my family operation is on the annuity scale. They're already renting it all out. So they're renting it all out. There, there is no equipment. There's no nothing. But if somebody wants to get back into it, I rarely ever see this where the ground has been rented out by the family. And then one of the kids says, Hey, I now want to actively start farming that. That tells, I got to go tell the parents and say, Hey, I don't want you to get the annuity anymore. <laughs> now I, I want to give you income somehow. How often does that, or what suggestions do you have for, that's kind of a reverse, bring it back to farming. It, it, it transitioned to an, it was an annuity and now we're going to transition it back into active farming. Well, I, I actually, I actually have a case like that day, which was very interesting because the farming son uh, was 40 and we, in, in coaching, we call it the boomerang. Mm-hmm. So a boomerang is a is a son or daughter who's had a 20 year career off the farm first and then has made his millions or done whatever. In this case, he also had a franchise of a coffee shop. But what was interesting in that is that he thought it was his right to come back and take over the farm and run it however gloriously he wanted to do that. His his other non farming brother who also had helped out with all kinds of harvest said, no, 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 this is our opportunity for everybody to have an ongoing connection with this farm. And his sisters were also very angry because they just thought he was like a bull in a China shop. Hmm. So um, I can't tell you the rest of that story because I asked too many hard questions and uh, we never did get to the family meeting, which was quite disturbing to me because I felt like the parents were, were very well bullied and um, very passive in, in saying, Whoa, Whoa. But I also have done in that situation and in all situations is I have a coach who is a, a CPA and he will go in and do an assessment as to the viability, right? I, don't, I, I just don't get this is, is that if, you, if, you've, if you've done your farming career and it's been good and that's great and that's fine, but you can't stay stuck in that financial positions if you need income from the farm to be generated to help you have a decent life going forward and and he this son just thought it was his right to come in and save the world and and be the farmer so quite often Dave those are going to have to be uh, what part of no do you not understand and then of course emotional blackmail comes in and say well if you're not going to give me what you want you're never going to see your grandchildren again and that's where farming and agriculture has become um, very emotional blackmail like where people are behaving in ways which are morally not right, but they're also behaving very badly. Very good. And uh, Tanner, I only have one other question for this, this whole podcast. And that is, um, largest transition of wealth, in my opinion, is about to happen. Uh, we had one of the largest generations, uh, the baby boomers, and as they downsize, we will see more acres, more farm businesses, transactions move. Um, what I've heard some speakers talk about, we're, we're in a world of hurt because of the amount that's going to move and how people are going to handle it and and that there could be more disaster. Do you have any comment to that, uh, statement, I guess? I, I would ask the listeners to write into my website and ask me for my list of wealth books, Dave. I have a financial psychologist coach. Her name is Dr. Moira Summers. She has helped our family immensely deal with what it means to transfer wealth and how to be psychologically healthy around money. And so um, people can ask me for that tool or we can get it in the show notes, Tanner. And what I'll also say to that is there's a dark side of wealth, correct? Mm -hmm. And I spoke uh, back in 2018, I think in Halifax, Canada, to the National Association of Financial Planners, the Institute for All Across Canada. And I remember sitting in this man's seminar and it was called the Great Wealth Transfer. (laughs) And that's exactly what we're sitting in. And people have to wrap their head around what's truly important what feels right to them, and and how do they separate people's money scripts from what money truly means to them? Yeah, and I I just sit here struggling to figure out a, a good way to wrap up our conversation. You know, we we're so grateful that you spent almost two hours, a little over two hours, with us mm-hmm. to one help the Hayes family in part one, and two field these listeners' questions. So. 
Um, I, I know they're going to view and value you as a resource, and I hope that they reach out to you and track you down. Remember, remind us again, what website should they go to? I was going to say, where do we find those books and how do we contact you? So um, best way to contact me is just go to farmfamilycoach.com. Or if the millennial farmers are on Instagram, they can go to Elaine, E-L-A-I-N-E underscore F underscore farm coach. I'm also on uh, Facebook at Farm Family Coach and Twitter and LinkedIn and all those good places, mostly just by my name, Elaine Fraze. On YouTube, if you just Google Farm Family Coach, my channel will come up and people can watch a lot of things that I've done on video. So Tanner, um, all of these other resources are just the best way is to go to farmfamilycoach.com forward slash contact. And people can request the tools that they want or get them from your show notes. And Elaine, I would have spelled your last name wrong. Phrase is F-R-O-E-S-E. Is that correct? That's right. So listeners, if you're just typing in her name, Elaine Phrase, F-R-O-E-S-E. Yeah, Dave, you said... And that's why I say farmfamilycoach.com because Uh that was found (laughs) my site. Yep. So that, Dave, you mentioned very wisely that we've got the largest wealth transfer approaching us here in the near future. We also had a couple of listeners that, that wrote in and we didn't ignore you about the 60 year old farmers who have never made a decision because grandpa is still actively involved. So, um, yeah, the handcuffs, uh, as far as that goes, the, the lifelong employee. Um, so yes, there's all going to be unique situations. We appreciate you writing in and, and sharing your thoughts. We did our best to try and keep them as general and applicable to everybody. But the best thing to do is to reach out to Elaine or to us. We can get you connected and we'll see if we can't get a little bit more continuity to the plan to where everybody can be a lot more comfortable. Um, I also have a, I also have a book on audible called building your farm legacy. So for all the young farmers and people who like to have something to listen to on their phones, just go to audible and uh, building your farm legacy is an audio book for farmers who don't have time to read, but I'll be coaching you while you drive down the field. Well, they'll be in tractors here pretty quick. Yeah. So that's a definitely a good suggestion. There. That's great. Thank you again, Elaine. We, we really appreciate it. And listeners, we, we can't thank you enough. And we also thank you for your patience. We know this has been one that you've requested for us to do for a long time. We wanted to find the right guest and the right structure, but please don't hesitate to suggest new topics, farm for profit, LLC at gmail.com. But until then... Have a good one. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long. Do you have your crop harvesting needs met for this fall? Gearinghoff is the best no matter what color or combine you got behind it. Making premium harvesting heads no matter the crop. Check them out at gearinghoff.com.